So, uh, at first of all, this is a joint work, so this is not just my work. Refactor R, uh, the group of Refactor R, uh, it's not just me, of course, but uh, a couple of PhD students and master students are in the project. So this is a joint work with one of my master students, uh, Daniel. Actually, he's here. So if you have some really uh, deep technical questions, then you can ask him uh, after the talk, of course. So uh, this talk is about uh, recovering Erlang syntax tree from the beam bytecode. And why we think is that important is not really uh, at general decompiling, but we wanted to improve our system refactor error with information gathered from uh, the bytecode. So uh, what we have basically is a tool that is able to analyze different Erlang source code. So if you have an Erlang source code, then refactor error is able to analyze it and uh, get lots of nice uh, uh, information, uh, syntactic, of course, and deep semantic information about uh, uh, dynamic structures and call graphs and data flow and lots of things. Uh, but when you have a file, um, a, a software component that is not available in source level, you just have the Beam version of that code and you are just calling functions, then the analysis of refactor error simply stops and say that, okay, I can see that there is a function call to that module, to that beam, but I'm not able to analyze it because I don't see the syntax tree, I don't see the source code. So that's why we think that if we can gather some information from these red boxes, then we can improve the information uh, provided to our users uh, in refactor error. So for example, we can see that this module uh, calls different black box modules. So we know that there is a function call because we see it in the source code, but we do not really know that there might be some connections between that black boxes. And maybe there are some other connections as well. So we wanted to explore these kinds of information and uh, add it to the uh, refactor errors uh, syntax tree, and of course, then run some semantic analysis on that. So this is our uh, main goal. Uh, enable refactor error to analyze not just the Erlang code, but also the beam byte code. What's refactor error? I do not know how familiar you are with refactor error. Could you please raise your hand if you heard this name? Okay, most of you, so just a few words. We have some developers here as well, ex-developers and current developers as well. So this is a static analyzer framework having lots of nice features. Of course, refactorings, because the name is coming from refactoring Erlang programs. That was the original goal of the project. Uh, but later we uh, switched uh, to code comprehension uh, support. So it has lots of um, uh, features that support code comprehensions like um, dependence graph visualization, uh, semantic queries, uh, also in built-in level and um, in user level. So a developer, uh, an Erlang developer can ask some information about the source code, like I have a function here and where I am calling this function in a way that the first argument is an atom or something like that, or a specific value. So you can ask, you can build your own queries like that. It's really helpful, for example, in debugging, when you find that there is a, a, a wrong value somewhere in the source code and, and you wanted to debug that where this value is coming from. Um, it has um, code metrics, source code uh, complexity and quality metrics, lots of interesting static analysis, and we wanted to extend this framework. What you see there is that dependence graph of the Nizia library of Erlang. So what we have is that we have an Erlang code, or at least we think that there were an Erlang code somewhere, and then the Erlang compiler compiled it to uh, a beam code, 
that looks like looks like this, and we wanted to analyze uh, this code. What uh, we assume uh, is that there's no debug info in the uh, at this level. There's no debug info uh, in the in the compiled Vim code. Uh, I think usually it's not available. Uh, we done uh, research, and Refactorer already has a, a component that is able to analyze source code uh, compiled to Beam with debug info. Because if you do this, then basically you have the abstract syntax tree or that kind of abstract format uh, in the compiled Beam code, and it's easy to recover. Uh, it's a bit harder when debug info is not available. Then you have a basically imperative uh, register-based language describing the functionality of your Erlang code, and we wanted to recover something that you see on the left-hand side uh, from, from this code. So what is the Beam bytecode uh, look, uh, look uh, like? So it is a, it compared to a machine code, it's a, it's a high level language. So, okay, it really looks like an assembly code and, and it's basically a register uh, based uh, um, imperative language describing the operations, the sequence of steps uh, that the Erlang virtual machine has to do during the evaluation but it has some high-level constructs as well. So, for example, it has special uh, language elements for blocking statement and expressing that I'm, I'm waiting for certain time and then I'm jumping to another, uh, to another label. Uh, what else? Uh, it has um, uh, special constructs, uh, um, for timer, I said, uh, picking up some messages from the message queue. So it also has a uh, 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 mm, language element for that. This is usually not a standard assembly-like operation. But it has registers, it has uh, jumps, and lots of other operation that is usually in machine code as well, S but enhanced with lots of Erlang-specific information. And what we wanted to do is basically try to extract uh, these high-level constructs and lift it to an Erlang language level. I think it's not so. Uh, and the main, it's not so important, it's just a refinement. So we try to add this to refactorer, and basically we wanted to get the syntax tree uh, from that code. Is it? easy or is it hard to do something like that? Uh, I think the answer is it's not easy to do it because we have an Erlang, as a really nice Erlang syntax, and we have a not so nice imperative style representation of the same code. And basically this code, what you see here is expressing uh, the control flow of the of the Erlang uh, function, uh, win with different uh, crossing edges and some kinds of ugly structures that is not really fits to a functional style. So the question here is how to transform a control flow that looks like this to a to an Erlang syntax that does not have real jump oper go to operations for example so ha have to do it you can see that there are different conditions uh, from the shape of the control flow graph so there are different conditions and uh, for example from if this condition holds we jump to this statement uh, and if this condition holds we jump to the same statement or it doesn't hold that. Yeah, no, in both of the cases, because here we have one. Okay, but how to express it in Erlang? Maybe with duplicating the code or something, but we have exactly uh, this structure in the Erlang code, 
if uh, even is okay, then I'll return done. If even is something else, then I'll return done as well. The compiler does some optimizations. So these code blocks that are exactly the same are not present twice in the, in the beam code. Uh, instead of that, there are some special go-to operations that are pointing to the same label in the beam code and, and makes our analysis a bit harder. And not just that, this is just a simple example. There are uh, not so many and not so heavy optimizations uh, in the beam code like uh, in usual machine code, uh, but, uh, um, but there are some and we had to discover them and try to build in into our analysis. So how is it working? So basically, we have a beam code. Uh, we using the Erlang's uh, disassemble module to get the disassembled version of that beam code, and we wanted to build the syntax tree. So basically, this is the pipeline we go through, and I will detail each of the steps. So we have different intermediate representations where we try to shape the um, imperative style, register-based language in different steps to be more functional and finally get the Erlang code, the Erlang syntax tree. So we use, as I mentioned, the Beam, uh, this uh, assembler module to get the uh, Beam language, uh, the uh, Erlang code written in the Beam uh, language. And if you just recognize some strange construct that there are some, some registers and you are referring some uh, positions uh, in the register, so x0, somewhere you have x1, you have some test that is equal uh, exactly um, what may, there are of course labels um, return statement and labels. So there are different operations. And the first step was to discover exactly that was the semantics of these operations. So to do that, we've introduced a, a so-called intermediate representation uh, for the beam code, because what you see in the beam code expresses basically lots of operations. So let's assume that we have a function call. Um, it's two down. I may try to be it a bit up. So if you have a function call in the, uh, in the um, beam code, it looks like, like this, that call exact only, exact function Erlang get module info one, and, and what happens? So from, from these kinds of operation, you do not really know what happens at the background. So we had to discover it. And to make it explicit, we introduced our uh, internal representation where we are describing the exact sequence of steps that are um, introduced or, or evaluated, uh, done by the Erlang virtual machine when that instruction is evaluated. So for example, in case of a function call, uh, it is described that what the uh, name of the uh, module, uh, the function name and the argument name, and we are transforming it to exact operations. So for example, that in this case, the uh, arguments are copied into the registers, and then finally the result of the arguments are copied to the registers as well. Uh, for example, if here we have not just one, so not just one argument, but the uh, uh, function has more than one argument, for example, two, three, then not just one uh, register is uh, filled with data, but other registers, so x0, x, x0, x1, x2, and so on, so on. So we have to copy all of the data into the registers. And then finally, we have to uh, set the return value into the zeros uh, register. So in case of a 
more complex function call. This is not just two instructions, but having more instructions as a, as a sequence of steps uh, that uh, uh, have to be done. So uh, this is why we introduced a new uh, representation. Uh, and not just for that, uh, the other reason is that uh, we do not have control over the beam's uh, semantics, so it may change if some new construct appears that may affect the, uh, the beam code as well. So if we have uh, that kind of intermediate representation and if we wanted to upgrade our analysis, we just, uh, at least we hope, we haven't tried it yet, <laughs> but at least we hope that we just have to modify this uh, this layer or this connection between the uh, disassembler beam version and the intermediate representation. So this is basically uh, why we are introduced, uh, uh, this representation. So we create an exact uh, model of control flow uh, uh, from the Erlang code. And I think I've already told this one, so I'm just jumping to the next slide. And now we are able to create a control flow graph from that intermediate representation. And this control flow graph will be the base of our analysis. Uh, this uh, describes that how the uh, Erlang function is evaluated uh, in the beam level uh, using the instructions introduced in the intermediate representation. It consists of some blocks of, uh, of nodes and some edges uh, describing sometimes uh, simple uh, connections, just uh, moving to the next uh, uh, block, or sometimes conditional connections between the blocks. When some condition holds, then we go this way, otherwise we go to the uh, other, uh, other way. So this is how uh, we represent the source code, the go-to operations, and the different instructions from the beam code or from the intermediate representation. And the next step is, is to try to restructure it to make it more functional. So what we are doing is the first step is to create a static single assignment version of this control flow graph. Uh, why is it important? because Erlang is a single assignment language. This is one reason, and this is really good for us. Uh, but this is not something that we uh, are invented. This is usually uh, a, a technique that is used in, in the compiling. And this is really good for us as well, because uh, Erlang is a single assignment language, so we, we can benefit from this representation. So what we are doing is that basically we are uh, creating <laughs> unique uh, variables, uh, from the from each control flow uh, passes, and whenever we found the two variables where different values assigned to that variables, then we are introducing a, a, a special function. This is called the phi function, that is basically a conditional functions uh, function containing the information that which uh, control flow pass uh, were executed. So basically you should, uh, I, I can explain it in a way that if all of the conditions uh, that match to this control flow graph holds, then we return the variable from the left-hand side pass. Otherwise, we if these conditions hold, we return the variable from the right-hand side pass. So basically we are using uh, this representation or that we just modify and create a static single assignment form uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the control flow graph. But it's still not enough uh, because uh, in usually this uh, SSA form can be used to define some uh, regions uh, in the uh, in the control flow uh, graph or in the SSR form of the control flow graph. So we have some uh, regions and then we um, uh, um, determine some entry and exit point for, uh, for these regions and then we can transform it to, uh, to um, 
real code or or whatever the next step of the analysis is depending on the target language. The problem is that the version of that control flow graph we are using is not structured. So we can't, uh, structured means that each uh, block has exactly one entry and exit point, and it's, it's not true. You can see that, for example, this block has two, this block has two as well. So this is not a structured control flow graph, so we cannot apply the rest of the uh, analysis on this graph and create an Erlang uh, syntax tree from it. So we have to somehow eliminate uh, these constructs, and there are different techniques to do it, um, also from the literature. And um, for example, one of them can be to use uh, code duplicates. So whenever you find something where two thing, uh, two different control flow edges point, then just simply duplicate that uh, block, for example, here, and then you won't have this problem anymore. If we do it in this way, then the resulted code may not look, uh, look like similar, not the same because it will never be the same as it was the original one, uh, but uh, it may result completely different uh, code that we had originally. So we do not use this one. Uh, instead of that, we try to identify some patterns in the control flow graph and, and try to restructure it uh, to a Erlangish style or something like that. So what we are doing is that we are using graph rewriting techniques. So we are applying lo lots of graph rewriting rules uh, on the control flow graph and try to reshape, uh, restructure uh, the control flow graph, the unstructured control flow graph to a structured control flow graph. Um, I do not want to go into details, but basically when you have a graph rewriting rule, you have a, a pattern that you wanted to match uh, on the graph with some conditions, and you replace that part with some new nodes, maybe one or more, uh, and with some uh, edges between the nodes. So we are expressing, for example, uh, one interesting question was that how to identify the branching statement, case uh, the result of case or function closes or if statements in the uh, um, control flow graph or the, uh, we cannot really identify that which one, one was it originally. We just see that it was a branching statement and we can uh, apply different graph rewriting rules uh, to try to uh, structure this control flow graph. And what else is needed is that we can apply this uh, simple uh, rules to reshape uh, our control flow graph, but not in a kind of uh, uh, brute force way. Uh, we, we need some, some kind of context analysis. So it's not really applied in a way that every pattern is, uh, is matched and then it just simply, uh, simply returns something because we know from some exact constructs that how they are look like. So for example, a, a receive uh, expression from the Erlang code is uh, compiled to a kind of loop function into the, uh, in, in the beam code, and we can uh, identify these contexts and, and try to improve our analysis based on that. So after, if we do this um, graph, or, or we applied this graph rewriting rules, we had to identify the uh, regions in the uh, control flow graph and create uh, the so-called uh, anormal form uh, of the uh, translated uh, static single assignment form, just to show you that how the, sorry, I forget it, 
uh, that from this, uh, the result of the rewrite uh, rules uh, is a structured control flow graph. So from this uh, crossing edges, uh, we create a control flow graph like that. And then in this graph, we can apply a transformation that creates the functional representation of the source code. This is called uh, a normal form, which is uh, really similar or, or can be a base of the uh, um, CPS, the continuation passing style uh, analysis as well. This is usually used by the compiler, these forms, because it uh, allows different um, optimizations uh, on, the, on the source code. So we can create a bit more functional, uh, and that's why it's a bit closer uh, to the Erlang syntax. So we have a functional representation now uh, from, the, uh, from the beam code. And then from this uh, beam code, uh, no, sorry, uh, this anormal form representation of the beam code, we can create the Erlang syntax tree. Is it now a much more simple transformation than to do it directly from the unstructured control flow graph? So another way can be to apply some uh, high-level analysis, domain-specific analysis on the, uh, on the control flow graph exactly and try to identify some specific Erlang constructs. But in this way, the, the transformation is so hard-coded, really hard to modify, and, and you cannot really do uh, small fixes on it because it's so robust. Uh, system. So that's why we have choose these small steps to introduce the uh, functional style uh, in, the, in, the URL, uh, in the beam code uh, during the transformations. And uh, it doesn't really look like uh, so functional at this moment, but it's much more closer to an Erlang syntax. And we are able to create the Erlang syntax tree from this code. I'm not... Uh, showing the syntax tree. Instead, of course, I'm showing the, uh, the, co uh, the uh, representation, the uh, string representation of the syntax tree, of course, the source code. So you, you can see, maybe those who are sitting at the <laughs> back can see, but that was our original module. So we had the handle event function. Uh, that uh, use a case expression and based on the uh, value of the event variable done different things. This was the original code and what we are able to do is to create a conditional and if a statement from this expression and, uh, and of course the conditions sometimes may be overlapping and, and some parts can be replaced with pattern matching. Of course, it's much more nicer to have an exact pattern matching instead of having, having that condition that whether it's a tuple and if it's a tuple, whether it has two elements. Of course, if we write the code, we write something like that, but we cannot uh, create that version of the source code because uh, directly from the beam, because these kinds of uh, pattern matchings are translated to conditional checking uh, during the compilation. So this is what we are able to produce from the beam code. And of course, some further optimization or shaping refactoring transformations can make it a bit closer, uh, modify it uh, to be a bit closer to the original syntax. I'm pretty sure that you never wanted to work with this code later on, but this is not the purpose of our research. Uh, we wanted to get the information uh, from the analyzed code. So let me show you a quick demo that, yes, we are really able to do it. Um, so the basic... Uh, scenario is that uh, we start refactor R simply and uh, this is a, a pretty mm, 
fresh refactor error, having nothing analyzed at the beginning, then I'm adding a new file. So I have a file, simply A, I'm adding it to the uh, database. Uh, just uh, stop it a bit. So you can see that uh, the content of the file uh, is just uh, really, uh, contains two really simple functions, one foo, one var, and, and we are calling, so foo calls bar with some values, and, and we have some variables and tuplings inside, and that's all. Okay, so this is basically what we have. And uh, I'm starting the web interface of the tool just to have a bit uh, fancier interface to show, just to promote refactorer that we have a nice web interface and that it's not necessary to use this uh, command line, so the Erlang shell interface. So uh, we are starting the web interface. You just press any name, what you want, and, and you can log in. And um, you can run some queries, as I said, uh, in refactorer. So for example, you can type your own queries uh, in, the, in the query go box, execute it, you have the results, you can see the source code uh, related to the result of the query uh, at the right-hand side. And we have some, uh, this was the uh, user-defined, uh, for the user-defined queries, uh, but of course, for certain entities in the source code, we have some built-in queries. So for example, for a variable, you may want to know that what is the, uh, where are the references to the variable, which is the binding point, what is the origin value of the variable, which means what are the possible values of that variable. So let me continue. And if you run this query now without analyzing the beam code, you see that, okay, let me stop it a bit. Uh, okay, I've asked the original values for this one, and I can see that this variable presents here, but I cannot recognize that what are the dependencies, for example, between the values, the arguments of the function that returns uh, y, uh, and then I'm extracting some values from that y variable, I can't do anything with it because the return value of var uh, depends on a function that is not available at source level. So what I'm doing is that I will analyze this code and try to see whether we uh, are able to determine more information. Um, so before that, I have uh, another uh, demonstration that tries to demonstrate, you can see that I'm switching to the dependence graph uh, tab now. So you can draw a dependence graph, for example, module or and function level. I've selected a function level dependence graph. And you can see that, okay, we have functions. Uh, we have two modules, we have functions in the module, and we can see that this function refers to this function, but nothing more. We can see that what are the dependencies uh, of this function. So that's why we are moving forward and try to uh, analyze. Uh, sorry, it was a mistake in during the recording. So this shell is the Erlang shell. Uh, so we try to analyze uh, the beam code. Uh, so the interface now basically just, you have to provide the name of the beam file. It's really simple. Uh, now, of course, we can uh, later do some uh, more accurate interfaces. And so I've done the analysis. Now I'm running again, so generating again the function call graph. And you can see that now I have a new function uh, that depends from uh, that fun uh, sorry, it was too quick. Okay, so I have a new function here that depends uh, that my old function, uh, the simple function, uh, depends on. So one new element introduced by anal uh, analyzing a uh, a simple graph. Now I'm running uh, the 
uh, query again, this was a box that uh, shows uh, that uh, the database changed, which means that I've added a new file. So all of the results of the previous queries are not accurate anymore. So I have to rerun the query. So I rerun the query and you can see not the same result because I have one more function. So I now I can realize that I have one more function in the beam module. And this is my old uh, foo function. And let's run the query, the origin query again, and see whether if we run the origin query, we will have more results uh, than we had before. If you see that lots of x0 and some never seen variables appeared, and there is a constant value there, this 42, uh, that expresses that basically the value of my variable is the value of this, uh, the exact value uh, of the function call. So we do not know what's happening inside, but somehow this 42 flows through this function and returns here to that variable. I think I have a um, version of this uh, Veeam code. I have an other demo. Just let me show that one because it shows the code. Uh, let me start this one. Okay. Sorry, it started. Okay, so this is the generated version of the code. And if you check, then you can see that this is the input, uh, the input argument of the function. It flows to the uh, y variable, then it's just back to a tuple, and then basically this value assigned to another variable and it's returned. So basically this is really there. So the value uh, that is used to call uh, the, uh, this function that was the same value that we used to call the bar function is simply flowed uh, in the return value uh, in a tuple. And what we are doing in the original code is that we've unpacked it from the tuple. Okay, so this is the result. It's really ugly uh, because there are lots of uh, <laughs> variables. Ah, and I have the original version. Sorry, of course I have the original version because I've created this example. So this is the original version. Uh, you can see that the in the original version, we just apply the uh, func2 function and uh, compounding this value, the return value and the original argument into a tuple. This is basically what we see. It's really obfuscated. Uh, if you are careful enough, then you can determine the same construct, or you can apply some refactoring transformation uh, to reshape the code or make it more cleaner. You have some variables like x0, 3, x11. So these are generated variable names, of course. And you can simply eliminate these uh, variables because it's not really, they are not really useful. So what I'm doing now is that I'm uh, eliminating all of the introduced variables. And finally, at the end, I will have a really similar code uh, that we uh, had before. The only difference will be that the uh, function there is qualified and here is not. It can be improved in the uh, current state of the implementation. We are introducing uh, um, qualified function names, so uh, function calls. So this is the only difference. And of course, the variable names. It's not possible to get the original variable names, neither macros or record syntax, of course. So there are some constructs that we are not able uh, to identify from the uh, original source code, but we try to uh, create a version, a syntax-free version that is close uh, to the original one. What 
we wanted to do, I left only one more slide, is, no, sorry, two. Uh, we've done some experiments uh, on not so small examples, uh, but on the code of, uh, uh, of the amnesia uh, from the Erlang OTP. So we've uh, selected some uh, modules and, uh, and uh, compiled it and try to get the syntax tree from that code. Uh, you can see that it's, uh, it's a bit slow now, so it's not really the same speed as we can do uh, when we are analyzing simple uh, Erlang source code, so it's much faster. Uh, we wanted to improve it. The time of the graph, applying the graph rewriting rules uh, is a big part of this total uh, execution time. Uh, we will try to do our best to uh, to improve it because uh, uh, you do not really want to wait two minutes to analyze a single module, even it has I don't know a, a few hundred or thousands lines of code. Okay, so it's uh, we know that it's slow at the moment. Uh, we will try to make it a bit faster. And uh, other things that we wanted to do is that uh, there are some. Uh, tricky transformations in the Bing code. For example, you will never see uh, your original list comprehensions or fun expressions in the Beam version of the code because local function definitions are created uh, from the head of the list comprehension and from the uh, fun expressions. And we see that there are, uh, in the Beam code, you can see that there is a function called there to a special local function. So now if you have a uh, fun expression, then we just simply create the brim created uh, local function from it, having this funny name with fun and uh, uh, having the um, original function name and I do not know exactly what in it and some, some indexes and so on and so on. So we are creating the local functions and then we are introducing uh, a function call. Uh, uh, when you apply uh, this fun expression. So it's a bit uh, different than the original one, but as I mentioned that we can apply some, some kind of pre-structuring, so before applying the graph rewriting rules, we can uh, apply some uh, context analysis and for example, based on the name of the fun expressions, we can identify, because they are so special, uh, then we can somehow, and, and from the context, we can analyze that it was originally a fun expression and then we can transform it in a different way. And so do with list comprehensions. Uh, we have some uh, issues with uh, binaries and catch patterns. We should uh, uh, refine our graph rewriting rules to handle them uh, properly. And the most interesting steps are just ahead that try to apply uh, these techniques and see what's happening with other languages compiled to the beam. For example, Elixir, but this is just one example. We can, we can try LFL or, or other languages as well and, and uh, try our architecture, whether it's uh, appropriate, whether we can use it, uh, what should be modified, uh, and one interesting question is whether we can create an Erlang syntax tree from an Elixir compiled bytecode, but this is not the case. Then we can refine, of course, the syntax tree generation as well and, and create some, uh, some uh, um, code, some Elixir-like syntax tree as well. So we will see. Uh, this is not started yet, uh, but uh, when we fixed um, the other issues that will be the next step uh, to do with uh, our analysis. I think I've uh, used all of my time, <laughs> so maybe uh, if you have questions quickly uh, or if you wanted to have a lunch, just <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, I do not want to be between you and, and, and your lunch, uh, but um, just feel free to ask now or later have time for at least two questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, did you look at a hype compiler? Um, so 
the hype compiler which is included yep. you can compile to ssa form from beam directly so it's already no. supported no no we haven't but we can try of course any more questions but uh, an ssa form but this is not structured am i right it's unstructured it's it's structured but if you want to do take it to the airline level, you would have to do the graph reduction. But everything, Good. all the steps before, you have in the hype compiler. Uh, okay, um, but the, uh, are you eliminating the go-to operations as well? So is it uh, is the hype compiler eliminating the uh, go-to instructions and uh, structure the uh, counter flow graph as well? Uh, we have to look in it. So I'm not quite sure, but because we we can have an unstructured version and and the structured version, and the rest of our analysis is based on the structured control flow graph. So the the syntax tree creation. Well, everyone's um, eager for lunch, I guess. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.